just going to say, turn to people and say hi to folks, okay? Turn around and say hi to folks. Move around and weave me out. Reach out to somebody you don't know.
Aren't you glad that Jesus found you? I was just sharing with a, a friend the other day. I was actually talking about how I don't deserve my wife because I was uh, quite a wild child and she was such an honorable servant of the Lord. And I was just talking about how we get things we don't deserve because God is good God is great. He hangs in there with us, amen? His great name is worthy to be praised this morning. So the Bible says where two or more gather that he is with us. He is here. So let him touch your heart this morning as we sing this new song. We learned it last week. Just let it touch your heart. God, we pray that you would move in our hearts today, Lord. We invite you, Jesus, to touch us this morning. And draw us closer to you, as your word says, Lord. Lost to say, find the way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name.
As much as I love the first contact people that you come in and you greet, you're greeted by Judy and Marceline, they also took upon themselves, with no great prodding, we can do the coffee. They had two people greeting and welcoming people, two, same two people doing coffee. One person doing snacks. I know you hate me right now, but I can take that. I can take that. Um, so we have a need in many, many ways. So when these two clipboards make their way back, please transfer them to the other side so people have a chance to sign up for this. I'm just going to say this. This is not huge, y'all. In the ministry of the church, these are not huge things. Uh, so what I'm going to ask again is that you prayerfully consider being a part of the team. We're going to probably send these around not just this week, but for the next couple of weeks to tell we guys to get people uh, uh, part of this, okay? Um, and Bill, can I add yeah, please do. So the snack part of it is you won't have to, you wouldn't have to miss the whole service. So it's just going down and counting the kids, how many kids we have that day. And, putting the snack together, and then just coming down after and getting the dishes done, which there isn't very many. There's just some pictures and stuff. But um, And I don't know what can, what the coffee all consists of. But um, if we could find someone who could lead that team, I put on a highlighted section on the top of that sheet. If that's something you could do, like organize the whole team and get them figured out which Sundays, that, that would be really helpful. Um, for the children's church, church part of it, the third through fifth graders, the Lions classroom, we have all the lessons ready for you. Um, if you felt like you couldn't do a whole month, if you could find a partner even and go along with your partner, and um, if that works better for you, go for it. Just put both names down and numbers. Um, we really need the help, and the kids are great down there. Um, and. Uh, and we still need a couple for the nursery, and that's the back sheet. It's the blue sheet, I think, behind the, the lion's one. But for sure, we need some third through fifth grade teachers here really soon. So, please. And, and fellas, I'm going to uh, elbow you with just a skosh. Because a lot of times when these clipboards come around to work with the children and do some serving of food, we pass it on to those who are next to us, meaning maybe our spouse or someone else. Um, I'm just going to make you feel guilty. This is on YouTube. <laughs> we have, we need people to be a part of the ministry of this church, and it's not happening. And uh, when that happens, you have people who are just absolutely afraid at their hands, uh, burnt out. Okay. Um, so let's pray over our children's church. So kids, come on up. We'll pray over you. I do have to show you a new present that I got. Amanda and Houston are trying to convert me. <laughs> Not a bad team to be converted to, you know, to tell you the truth. So I'm going to be sporting this every now and then. <laughs> the key part of, of even remembering who uh, you know, the, the, des the des uh, desolation that's been taking place with all the natural disasters and stuff that are now past, especially places like Houston and Puerto Rico and, and uh, the islands that are out there, okay? All right, let's pray. God, we are grateful for um, the opportunity that you put before us to be a part of your work, God. Um, it is not a passive thing. It is something that's active. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's something that we lack uh, either the inspiration for or the time, help us to reframe our priorities in, in relationship with you. Uh, God, we uh, pray over our children today as they go downstairs. May they be blessed by the teaching. May they be overwhelmed with your love by the teachers. And Father, may the teachers be filled back up with the kind of activities that take place and the kids being around them. Uh, Father, we love you. We also want to pray over our offering. God, that at this time as we, uh, as your word says, uh, give back a portion of what you provide to us with a glad and cheerful heart. Uh, Father, may we be held accountable to what you provide for us to do good work, good things. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
What's the young lady's name? Holly. Holly. I want you to write down Holly, 27 year old who's dealing with an incredible series of cancerous type of dis disturbances in her body. I, in fact, I may read her text that was forwarded to me from Marge, if that's okay with you. Okay. Uh, Holly, worship team and, and, and our kids downstairs. Uh, Gabriel is still struggling. The young boy who's gone through a number of surgeries. He's a little guy. Uh, made great progress and then fell backwards uh, physically. Want to pray for him. Jordan was over in Thailand teaching. Uh, Fred and Joanne, please continue to lift up Fred in his battle. Uh, and the young, the young lady who used to sit right there in that open space named Sharon. I think it's easy for us, at least sometimes, unfortunately, it becomes too easy for me that if I don't see someone, I kind of move, lose sight of them with everything that's going on in our lives. But Sharon needs your prayers. Um, she's, she's such a diligent servant, uh, and I know she misses being here with you all. So please, please pray for her. Uh, any various art, outreaches that might be going on, our families, our, our, our country, and so forth. Um, but it's just a, you know, I know today for some reason, from the beginning that I walked up to this building, I felt like there was burdens out there. And I know that there are every Sunday, but today just kind of felt a little bit more so. So I'm going to read this, okay? And that is a, a text that was forwarded to me from, um, from Marge Pollock. This is a 27-year-old uh, girl. All before 8 a.m. today, this was this past week, all before 8 a.m. today, my life went from a high I can't explain to heartbreak in the blink of an eye. I've now been in the hospital for over half the month of September by the looks of my scans. I better get used to being comfortable in these beds. My mom's face as well as mine lit up when we knew today was the day that we would be coming home. Little did we know that God had more in mind for us. My radiation doctor made his rounds this morning and started with the good news. The gamma knife treatments to my brain were successful, although the tumors had shrunk. Praise God. There is, however, a new tumor, but he is confident that those of gamma knife and it should be shrinking right now. The radiation to my pelvic bones worked as well. Both sides show the tumors have shrunk. The not so good news is that there are now new spots on both my lungs that he wants me to start getting back into oral chemo. So as soon as I can try to as soon as I can and try to stop them from growing systematically. He also wants me to get started on radiation to my sternum. I had a hot lymph node and there are cancer cells present in that chest region, but due to my body not healing my pneumothorax yet cannot start to heal because it's too slow and the cancer is too aggressive. The bad news, the tumor on my neck <coughs> ate away at the bone and unfortunately caused my neck to break. Thankfully, the MRI this morning showed that my spinal cord is damaged and I only have minimal damage done. I will be having neck surgery next Tuesday in Spokane. The heartbreak of hearing all this at once was unbearable and there for a moment I didn't think my body and my mind could take it. I wanted to throw in the towel. When this, when, especially when the doctor said there's no more riding horses for me. How much bad news can one withstand? I don't know why, why it seems to be just getting worse, but I know God doesn't punish us. I know he has a plan, and I have put my trust in him and hold on like her to be for the good news. I honestly don't have much to say. I'm hurting, but just wanted to update all those who pray. Just wanted to update all those who are praying because I am leaning on those prayers and the saving grace of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for all your prayers and love. 27. So, um, I know that there are a lot of things on people's plates. That is a human condition because we're not where? Home yet. We're not home. Um, and there are many things that, that continue to hurt us. And so, I, I mean, as I... As I Walked in today and got kind of overwhelmed with stuff that's hurting on people's minds, especially from being burnt out. I thought I should change my message. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think I'm going to change the message. Um, because we have communion today. And the heart of this message really is, is kind of touching on the aspect related to what I, I've asked for and what uh, I believe Beth is seeking. Uh, and that is the message of communion. When... When we read in Scripture, and it's in Luke, and we're going to read all four Gospels related to the Lord's Supper today. Um, I found, found an interesting thing that's been there the whole time I've ever read them. Just like Scripture and how the Holy Spirit works, He reveals things, even though you've read it a hundred times or more. Something different. Today I just got kind of like, hmm, this, I haven't seen that before. What's the intended, unintended message that you just gave to me? And um, it is about... Um, 
the fact that we are to do this in remembrance of him. And in only one of the four Gospels does it really say that, uh, in terms of the four Gospels and from the disciples' perspective. So we're going to read the four Gospel renditions of the Lord's Supper and, and focus on one particularly. So if you would, uh, we're going to look at what the intended messages are and also what's the unintended message of, of particularly John. So Matthew 26 is where we're going to start. It's always safe if you just read Scripture, you know, and not really worry about doing it much, much else, but just read Scripture and the passages that go with that. So Matthew 26, I'm going to read verses 20 through 30. And these all relate to the Lord's Supper, to the, to the Passover, to the last uh, meal that uh, Jesus with his disciples had. Now when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And being deeply grieved, they, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And he said to them, You have said it yourself. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take it and eat this. This is my body. Am I lost? Have I lost you all so far? Okay. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood out of the, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Isn't that it? There's a hymn that comes after this, after they have had this, uh, this brief time uh, of, of communion and fellowship. So now I want you to turn, and kind of keep in your mind what, what it is we just read. Turn to Mark chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 17. Similar thing has just happened prior to that Jesus has sent his disciples or a couple of his disciples forward to find a place to go to. He sets the table for where they're going to find these folks. And, and being able to set up the room for the Last Supper, okay? So in verse 17 is where I'm going to start in chapter 14 of Mark. And when it was evening, again, they're confirming that it was evening time, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who was eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him, One by one, surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And while they were eating, he took some bread, and after blessing it, broke it. And he gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Okay, let's turn to the third one, which is Luke chapter 22. Pretty consistent uh, so far in terms of what we're hearing. Very, very consistent in terms of what the recollection is, what their writing is, what they're remembering. Okay, so Luke chapter 22, we're going to get another piece of insight, which we're going to see very similar. Um, rendition of what happened. And we're going to start in verse 20, 14. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat, eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God has come. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going, as it has been determined. But woe to that man who, by whom he has been betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it was might be it might be who was going to, to do this thing. And then it kind of uh, kind of uh, devolves into a whole discussion about who's the greatest amongst this group of twelve disciples. Who's the greatest? Rather than really examining themselves, they start to have arguments about who's the greatest. And that is kind of an ironic thing about us in this in this time of life 
that we always don't want to see how we may have failed our God. Now, the great thing about our God is that His grace overwhelms us. His grace overcomes our failings. His grace lifts us up out of the depths of despair and allows us to get back on track. Allows us to be able to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to move past this, I'm going to move forward with you, God, even though I might trip up, even though I might fail, I'm going to reach up and grab on your hand so that I might be able to walk firmly with you. And what we're going to see, what we've seen so far is with these three renditions, we see a common eight theme, and that is a preparation for the meal, a gathering in the upper room, an eating of the meal, the calling out of Judas, blessing and breaking of the bread, bread blessing and partaking of the wine, a teaching from Jesus, and then a hymn. And the hymn is, is, as I've read commentaries, was along the lines of Psalm, 18, uh, Psalm 18, 118. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. But we're going to read in John. And this is where, as I was getting prepared for this, as I read John, and I've read this, this section of John, I don't know how many times, and it just leapt up at me that, huh, this is a very different rendition or remembrance of the Lord's Supper that gives us insight into John. So I want you to turn to John, and we're going to read in verse 4, chapter 13. To me, this represents something very significant in our life with Christ, in our life with one another, uh, in serving and in uh, ministering to one another. And it's also one of those aspects of service that we don't practice in church much. We don't do it very often. And as we read this, I want you to think about the nine things, the eight things that we just read about in the, in the other three Gospels. The very common things that were that were part of it. And so in verse um, chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. Now before the feast of Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he should be, depart this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. And so he came upon Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you just wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him for this reason. He said, Not all of you are clean. I'm going to finish up with uh, 12 through 17. And he said, And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So I gave you an example that you also should do as I did for you. Truly I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Don't you find it interesting that in this passage, when John, who... Who I really like to read. I can't tell you how many times I've read that. There's no reference to communion. There is no reference to communion. Does it, did it happen? I firmly believe that it did. But here is the, the apostle that is, is, we read about in Scripture, that is the one that Jesus loved most deeply, most dearly. And what is it that meant something to him? What is it that overwhelmed him? It was surely, I know, the, the profound words of saying, take this bread and eat it because it's my body, but also drink this cup for it's my blood of a new and everlasting covenant. But what he recalls and wants you and I to hear about is servanthood. So what I'm going to ask us to think about today as we get here up for communion is in our life, communion is, I'm not going to say communion is easy because absolutely, we're, we're, in a little while we're supposed to take a moment to look back and remember the sacrifice of Christ. Absolutely. We're also, as Scripture tells us, to look in, to examine our own hearts. How, how, what's interfering with my relationship with God? What's interfering with my service to God? And then to look forward, to, re, to understand that God is coming back. And in the meantime, He has left us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be able to have the strength to do all that He has asked us to do. 
there are several passages that I'm going to refer to today, and one of them I'll ask us to read. But um, it's interesting that, that to me, John's emphasis in, in, in this whole evening, the last evening with his, with his master, with his savior, with his king, with his friend, was to recognize the example of servanthood, of serving one another. And I wonder, how would Jesus really want us to remember? Does he want us just to take these elements and then leave and not think anything about it? This is easy to come up and, and partake in, in, in the Lord's Supper. It is much more difficult. It is much more challenging to go out and serve, to stay within and serve. And, and it's that aspect. I had a really nice visit this morning with Carmen, um, who was part of the church up in Orfino, and she said, I have to disagree with you about something. And I always like it when somebody who I respect greatly comes up and says, I have to disagree with you about something. And she said this. She said, you know, you and, and most pastors that I, I, I know, and she said, you said this last week, and I remember saying it, that is we're to pick up our cross. And the cross is not supposed to be easy. That it's difficult. It's challenging. But she said, you know what? I'm going to disagree with this. And that is that when we pick up the cross, we pick up the freedom of Christ. And it was like a revelation for me. It was like, boom, huh? I hadn't thought about it that way, really. I've always thought about it as, as absolutely the difficult things of picking up the cross and carrying it. It is not a picking up of a blanket and a pillow and being comfortable as a Christian. I understand that. But this was just nice to hear. That, it, it, that when we pick up the cross, we pick up the freedom of Jesus Christ. We pick up the freedom to leave behind all that's dogmas. We pick up the freedom to move forward to love and to serve others well. And that happens when we are in good communion with our Savior, with our God. Communion is absolutely essential for us. When we gather together, we, Paul, when he's teaching the Corinthian church, emphasizes the need to leave behind selfish behaviors. When, he, when Paul uh, addresses the church in Corinth, uh, in 1 Corinthians, he is talking to them about how they have really ridiculed and made the communion aspect, the Last Supper, an orgy of selfish desire, of selfishness. And he wants them to remember, and these were, this was written to Christians, people who had forgotten and lost sight of servanthood and of self, uh, self-sacrifice to meet the needs of others. And he writes to them and asks them to get back to what was most important, and that is to remember the sacrifice of Christ, the servant nature of the Lord God of all creation when he came to this earth, sought to give an example to his disciples by taking off and girding himself and cleaning the most filthy part of a person who walked around in Jerusalem and Israel at that time and said, this is what you need to do for others, to serve one another. And I find it ironic today, you know, and again, as I, as I thought more and more about this, this message, I thought maybe I should change it because this is kind of, kind of heavy. But as I thought about it and, and talked to a few more people that are just burnt, I thought we need to be reminded that this doesn't function without you. This does not function without your involvement. It doesn't. And one of the people, I, I said this to him, I said, what would happen if we just folded up our doors? You'd find a place to go to church, you wouldn't. You'd find a place to go. You'd find a place that would meet your needs and you could sit and watch and take participate in the leave. You would find that. I would find that. What would happen if this church just didn't exist anymore? One, I'd be sad. Not for myself, but for this church and for those who have sacrificed their lives because of Chris for the last 30 or 40 years. But in the grand scheme of things, what would happen? And this person said, oh, I don't think we should do that. And I said, I'm not proposing that we do that. <laughs> Please, now don't leave today and say, Bill's going to shut this church down. I'm not, I didn't say that. I said, what's the big deal? What would happen? Okay? Because we cannot go on. For nine years now, the same people have been doing the same thing. Every now and then, somebody else comes in and then leaves. Somebody else comes in and then leaves. But um, as we plead with folks to say, we need your help. We need people to do small things. If you're a hugger, go back and talk to those two lovely ladies in the back of the church and say, hey, can I relieve you some Sunday? Because I'd like to hug some folks. And if you ever do that, be ready for people to come in and as you start to hug them, go, no. Takes a while to get used to hugging when you first come into a building in a church. 
It doesn't take much to repair coffee. It doesn't take much to fix snacks. It doesn't take much to teach our children. It doesn't take much to help usher. It doesn't take much to be part of the offering, to collect and move, move the, you know how hard that is? But it sure is helpful when people want to be a part of that. The example that I read here is about do this in remembrance of me. Serve one another in remembrance of me. The world out there is a very selfish world. It is a me, myself, and I. We're supposed to be different, and we do that by serving one another. The bread and the cup symbolize sacrifice. We, we take a, partake of the communion uh, elements to remind ourselves of the incredible, painful, agonizing death that Jesus went through for us. We participate in the dipping of, of, of our bread into the, into the grape juice to remember the, the blood that was shed for us. But we also remember that the tomb is empty and that when Jesus left, he said, I will leave you a comforter, a comforter that will give you the power to endure, the comforter that will give you the power to look beyond yourself. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 1 Peter 4, 10 says, Each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Galatians 5, 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And you're out there thinking, well, I don't have time. Uh, my life is spinning out of control. And I believe that. I believe that. As a person who has this job and three full-time jobs at the college, I understand that. I understand that. I also know that, that without saying no sometimes to certain things, we can't say yes to this. If there's any place to say yes, it's here. If there's any place in which God wants us to say no, it's out there to the things that cause us to lose sight of what's most important. And that is our communion with our Lord and Savior. That's where he calls us to, to be the example that goes out to the world to say, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm serving. Now, we serve the world, absolutely. Okay? But what I want us to understand is this, and that is that this doesn't happen without you. It just doesn't. So communion, as we go through communion this morning, if you haven't had communion with us before, this is one way that we do it. I have uh, bread on plates on each side of on these tables. Uh, I encourage you to come up with one another. And if you see somebody coming up by themselves, jump up and be there with them. Take a moment at the table. Have somebody in your group maybe say a brief prayer uh, about examination and about the freedom that God has given us through Christ. The incredible freedom to be released of all of our junk, all of our stuff, all of our failings, so that we can move forward and serve one another. Life is busy. I think even in these days, they were busy. They didn't have the convenience of a lot of things that we have conveniences for. I watched a movie called All the President's Men last night. And it was funny to see just back in 1976 and 7 that they were still using typewriters. And phones and phone booths and things like that. Were we busy back then? Guarantee we were. I remember a book that came out uh, called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. It's one of the first books I read when I came up to college here. And in his book, he said that the onset, the advent, the use of the computer would give us more leisure time. He said we will have a 20-hour work week and the rest will be spent in relaxation and leisure. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that hasn't happened. In fact, it has intensified our connectivity. We have to disconnect purposely. We have to say no purposely so that we can say yes where it counts. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Bill, how do I say no to my family? I'm not saying that. You need to say yes to your family. But here's the other thing. Husbands, how do you serve your wife? When's the last time you prayed with her? When's the last time you grabbed your wife's hand and said, let me pray with you or for you? Wives, when's the last time you grabbed your husband and said, can I pray for you to encourage you? Parents, when's the last time you grabbed on to your kids and said, let's stop for a while and pray together? 
Let's lift up what's going on in our family. Let's find a way to disconnect all the busyness and to be still long enough to recognize real communion that we're going to celebrate is really in serving each other. And I know how hard it is, husbands, <laughs> to pray with your wife. I know how hard it is. And you know what? It's not that hard. But when myself gets in the way, that's when it gets hard. Because if there's an argument, if there's a dis, uh, disequilibrium in the relationship, you know how hard it is? You know who has the bigger mantle on their shoulders? We do, husbands. To lead. To lead by example. To fill our wives up. To fill our friends up. To, to reach out and grab onto somebody who's, who's, who's distraught. You know how many times I, um, I say, um, should I say, you ain't going to say, you know how many times I whine? It isn't just on Wine Down Wednesday. <laughs> I whine a lot. I try not to whine to Jennifer. So I whine in the truck while I'm driving. <laughs> I whine. And then amazingly enough, something happens. God's whispering voice happens and says, I'm here. You can't do this on your own. You're not supposed to do it on your own. You're supposed to do it with me. And I'm struck very quickly with how little communion I've had prior to that moment with my Savior. Communion is, yes, about this, but it's about seeking a way to serve. I would be really sad not to have the privilege and the honor of serving you. I would be sad not to see you, although we would see each other if the door was shut. But what would be more glorious to God, what would glorify God, would be if this church woke up and started to serve actively. Actively. To have communion that goes beyond the Lord's Supper and epitomizes the message that John gives us. That the Lord God of all creation put on a towel and wiped human beings' feet. So I'm going to leave that out there. And I know it's a, one of those you'll walk away going, especially if you're a guest, Holly, I'm sorry that you're here. I'm not sorry that you're here today. I'm talking to Holly, it, it, it isn't always kind of like this. But sometimes I think we need it. I remember going to see Jennifer, going with Jennifer when she was getting a shot in her knee. Anybody ever have a shot in your knee? Oh, the needle looks this long. This long. And, and I looked at Jennifer and I thought, my bony little knees would probably start a fire if that needle came in and struck, struck one of my bones and all of a sudden it would start a fire. But I watched Jennifer take that needle into her knee. And I just, I had to go, well. But she needed that, that in order to be okay. We need you in order to serve well and to glorify our Savior in a way that he asks it to. To move beyond communion into real communion and servanthood. So, I'm going to uh, open up the elements and, and uh, I'm going to pray over them. I'm going to give us each a chance to take a moment and reflect and examine our hearts. And then, as you are ready, come forward and participate in this form of communion together. And again, if you see somebody by themselves, jump up and hang with them. Take some time. Don't rush through this. Don't rush through it. Take some time to reflect as you sit here about, are you talking to me? The answer to that is yes. Okay? Let God speak to you more powerfully. Let's pray. Bow your heads and let's pray. God, we are grateful that you are a God who loves us deeply. You love us so much. And sometimes I'm amazed that you love me so much. And you continue to love me. And God, I'm just so grateful that you are a God of all creation that walked this planet and knows what it's like to hurt. Knows what it's like to be alone. Knows what it's like to be sad and to laugh and to be joyful. You know every emotion that we have. You gave it to us. 
And so God, today as we examine our hearts, as we take a moment to think about our life with you, our communion with you, and also with our church, the church that you've planted us in. Father, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would move people. Because I can't do it on my own. It's you, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit that moves people. Help people get stronger. Help people get healed. Help people to have the peace that comes from being close to you. And let that be, as we sang today, the opportunity to enjoy your presence, to really feel the power of your great name in our life. We also bind the enemy right now, God, that the enemy has no place in here. The enemy has no place in our life, and it is at the power of your great name when we say, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, that he runs. God, may you be blessed this week by how we live our life, by how we serve, by how we seek about opportunities to serve the world and absolutely in our church. Father, may you be glorified. And Father, may be, this be a time in which we are re-inspired, reinvigorated with our life with you. With our life with you. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. When you're ready, come on up and, and have communion up here.
been blessed over the last, um, I don't know how long, uh, by this couple. Uh, they, they come in and they go out, and I bless, they're blessed for their blessing to me. And Will and Mario, this is their last Sunday with us. And they are leaving, and I'm going to have Will and Mario come up this way, please. Mario makes some seriously delicious pumpkin pie. <laughs> Well, if you wouldn't mind just telling everyone where you guys are heading off and what you're up to, okay? Many of you probably don't know who we are, what we do, but um, we live in Panama. I've been there 15 years. I've been down with the humanitarian aid program, and uh, still there. That's where I met my girl. It's, uh, we went down there for aviation stuff. I'm a pilot, bush pilot, so we're trying to get into an area difficult for Wings of Hope. And uh, then we stayed afterwards and we uh, worked, they do skill training with a group called Christians in Action, Christians in Action Missions International. And uh, it's, that's why we come back and forth, we come up here, we're so supportive, meaning that we come back and earn up a little enough to go down there and continue on. So that's what we've run down. And we thank you for your prayers and we enjoy being here and getting to know everybody. It's, Bill has been a big, uh, Sam's Lewis has been a big support for us, just having uh, friends and people. So if you wouldn't mind joining us as we pray, and what I've asked Lewis is if he would translate the prayer so that Marielle hears all of it. Um, you bless me. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's pray. Father God, we are grateful. For who you are in our life. We thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us, but especially for Will and Marielle. Thank you for their blessing to me, the encouragement they give me, and in the way that they have been a part of our family here. We ask God you bless them, cover them in your grace, your strengthening hand, and as they go about their life in Panama, that God you protect them, uphold them, and God bring them back to us, so that we might continue to know what's going on in the world. So we know what God feels what is done. I see in your neighbors. Father, go with them and make their path straight. They could name us. We in the days of to to come in. And again, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Dios, for their presence in our life. For su presencia en nuestra vida. We love you, Father. Te amamos, Dios, and we love them. Thank you, Dios, and we love you. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Sunday last week, and I said, really, we missed it? And they said, no, next week is our last Sunday. So I was really glad that we were able to, to pray for them and, and to encourage them. And, and again, it's just been a blessing to know them, as it is always a blessing to know you all. And Holly, if we were to shut this church down, I wouldn't have met you. So we're not going to shut this church down. Please understand that. Please don't leave today thinking that that's what I said. <laughs> it's not what I said. I mean, not as if I had any power to do that. Uh, God does not want that to happen. What God wants from us is good communion. Good communion that goes beyond the table and goes out there and also in here. God bless you. Have a, an incredibly blessed day today. And uh, uh, find a way to be a blessing to someone else, okay? And if you get a chance, just stop by and say hi and bye to uh, Will and Mariella as you go, okay? God bless you.